cross has spoken I am forgiven The King of kings calls me his own Beautiful Savior I'm yours forever Jesus Christ My living hope Hallelujah Praise the one who set me free Hallelujah Death has lost its grip on me You have broken every chain There's salvation in your name Jesus Christ My living hope Then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the promise your very body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me oh jesus yours is the Christ, my living hope, hallelujah, praise the one who set me free, hallelujah, death that lost its grip on me, you have broken every chain, there's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope, Jesus Christ, my living hope, oh God you are my living hope. God, we praise you for sending Jesus to save us. He is our hope. And Lord, this morning as we open your word, uh, we come like people who wanna build our lives on the rock. We wanna build our lives on the foundation of your word. And so we ask you to speak to us. God, we know that we can read your word and we can hear your word preached, but it is your Holy Spirit that must give us ears to hear. And so we ask right now for that grace. We ask for your illumination to light up your truth in our hearts so that we can know you and, and love you and fully trust that living hope that we've been singing about. God, we look to you, we trust you, and we ask you to lead us now. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. On some level, war is something that everyone understands. Obviously, uh, some understand it on a deeper level than others. For example, there are some who are acquainted with war uh, because they have been called to take up arms and defend their country. They are soldiers. They know what it's like to be called into action. But while not all of us have been acquainted with battle in this way, I think we all have some sense of what war is like. War is conflict. War is about force and strength and power. And war is a matter of life and death. Whether you realize it or not, you were born into a battle. The reason that things are not as 
the way they are supposed to be is that we are living in a world at war. Something has gone wrong and we are right in the middle of it. See, when God made the world, uh, he was handcrafting a place where his people could dwell in his presence. At the culmination of God's good creation, God made human beings who would reflect his image and he placed them in a garden that was formed just for them. They were God's people in God's place with God's presence. All was good and all was at rest. But the humans whom God created to reflect him had an adversary. The serpent of old, the devil, tempted the humans. This was the first skirmish on the earth. This battle was a conflict. It was about force and power and strength. And it was a matter of life and death. The humans listened to the serpent. They fell under his power. And the saddest thing of all, they declared war on God. Being like God and reflecting him was not enough. They wanted to be God. With one act of treason, all that was good was broken. Rest was lost. Humans were no longer God's people in God's place with God's presence, enjoying God's peace. This is a world at war, and there are no exceptions, no disqualifications, and there are no discharge papers. When you are tempted to tell a small lie at work to get ahead, uh, when you and your wife keep having the same argument over and over again, when you want to come clean about your sin, but you're afraid that you might ruin everything, when you're deathly afraid to share the gospel with your coworker who you know needs Jesus, it is in those moments when we know that we are in a war. We were born into a battle. Now, when I say the phrase spiritual warfare, I'm sure that there are many different things that come into your mind. Uh, most of us think of spiritual warfare as something for the super Christians, uh, most of us think of spiritual warfare as those intense attacks that happen to people who are highly engaged in vocational ministry. Or we might even think of the evil forces behind global terrorism. And while it is true that spiritual warfare can be intense and serious and have cosmic ramifications, spiritual war is less about exercising demons and more about slaying the sin in our hearts. Spiritual war is less about terrorist attacks, and it is more about the decision I make every morning whether to read my Bible or not. Spiritual war is less about the bad things that happen, happen to people serving in vocational ministry, and it is more about whether or not I'll take that small step of obedience that I feel like God is calling me to. The final goal of spiritual war is God establishing his people in his place with his presence enjoying his peace. So while his victory will include casting out demons and bringing evil, evil cosmic powers to their knees, most of the time, your spiritual war will be in the everyday, ordinary, mundane beliefs, thoughts, and decisions that you make. You are engaged in a spiritual war that isn't just for the super saint. It is the everyday, ordinary Christianity that you and I live out by God's grace and for God's glory. Psalm 60, where we're gonna be today, exists to wake us up to the war that we are in and to equip us to attack all the darkness, all the darkness that is in us and all the darkness that is around us with the light of Christ. So if you have a Bible, I wanna invite you to open it to Psalm 60, and we're going to read that psalm together. Psalm 60, to the choir master, according to Shushan Edith, a mictum of David, for instruction, when he strove with Aram Naharim and with Aram Zobah, and when Joab, on his return, struck down 12,000 of Edom in the Valley of Salt. O oh God, you have rejected us, broken our defenses. 
You have been angry. Oh, restore us. You have made the land to quake. You have torn it open. Repair its breaches, for it totters. You have made your people see hard things. You have given us wine to drink that made us stagger. You have set up a banner for those who fear you, that they may flee to it from the bow. Selah. That your beloved ones may be delivered. Give salvation by your right hand and answer us. God has spoken in his holiness. With exultation, I will divide up Shechem and portion out the vale of Succoth. Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. Ephraim is my helmet. Judah is my scepter. Moab is my wash basin. Upon Edom, I cast my shoe. Over Philistia, I shout in triumph. Who will bring me to the fortified city? Who will lead me to Edom? Have you not rejected us, O God? You do not go forth, O God, with our armies. O grant us help against the foe, for vain is the salvation of man. With God we shall do valiantly. It is he who will tread down our foes. This is God's word to God's people. So first off, in the superscript of this psalm, that little portion right there above verse 1, uh, we learn that David has written it as a teaching psalm. It says that it's written for instruction. David is teaching us how to engage in spiritual war that we find ourselves in. This is the God-inspired strategy for spiritual war. So first, David teaches us that repentance is our turning point in spiritual war. Repentance is our turning point in spiritual war. Verses one through three open up to a very bleak scene. David envisions the nation as a war-torn place. If you were to go and read uh, the beginning of 2 Samuel, where this psalm comes from, you will see the suicide of a national leader, uh, the treason, treason and execution, uh, cold-blooded murders, war with neighboring countries, and even civil war among God's people themselves. As David describes it for us here in this psalm, you can pretty quickly get a sense of his anguish. But the most difficult part of this section of the psalm is that David attributes all of these things that have happened to God himself. He says, you have rejected us. You have been angry. You have made the land to quake. You have torn it open. You have made your people see hard things. You have given us wine to drink. As David thinks back over the reality of the nation of Israel, he laments over the fact that it is as if God himself has opened the gates to let the enemies come in. It is like God himself has reached down and ripped the land wide open. It is like God himself has forced them to peel back their eyelids and and watch the hard things that are happening all around them. It is like God himself has spiked their drink so that the whole nation can barely hold itself up. Sometimes what we need is for God to break us. Sometimes what we need is for God to tear our land apart. Sometimes what we need is for God to cause us to see hard things. There's something about seeing hard things that changes us. Many times, uh, people who take mission trips to places where people live in extreme poverty are affected forever by what they see there. Recently, I watched a documentary where a a photographer named Simon Lister goes to difficult places to document some of the hard living conditions for children around the world. Uh, To watch these kids walking barefoot through a trash heap looking for scraps of plastic to go and recycle so that they can have just enough money to buy their dinner is a hard thing to see. Simon says in the documentary that he sees his mission as taking these hard photos to raise awareness and to call people to action. 
These first few verses of our psalm is like a snapshot of how God will uh, at times cause his people to see hard things and experience hard times so that their hearts will be awakened to the tragedy of sin. But there's also good news here. God's judgment is never the ultimate or final word to his people. So for all these things that David has said that God has done, there is one more thing. In verse four, David says, you have set up a banner for those who fear you, that they may flee to it from the bow. The idea is that in the midst of this war-torn place, God has set up a refuge. There is a waving flag in the distance, and if we will run to it, then we will be saved. This idea of God setting up a, up a, up a banner for his people to find safety is found in other places in the Bible. One of those famous places in it is in Numbers chapter 21. God had brought the Israelites out of Egypt, but they begin to grumble and complain, and so they sin against God. And in, in response to their sin, God disciplines them by sending snakes that actually bite and kill many of the Israelites. Well, they admit their sin to God and they cry out for mercy, and this is how God responds. He says, And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Uh, when the text here in Numbers says that Moses set the serpent on a pole, it is the same word used here in Psalm 60 for a banner. And really, it's the same idea. Uh, the people have sinned. Our sin deserves death. But God has provided a way of escape. And this is what gets us to the idea of repentance. Simply put, repentance is turning from our sin and turning to God. If we are to find protection from God, then we must turn to God. Repentance isn't just feeling sorry. Repentance is fleeing to Jesus for salvation. See, in John chapter three, Jesus teaches us that, that, that this image throughout the Old Testament of God raising a banner was actually pointing forward to him. He said, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. The place that we must look, which God has set up for us, is his banner, Jesus Christ. Fleeing to God's banner means running away from everything else. It means casting aside all the other things that we love and all the things that we look to for help and fixing our eyes solely and fully on Jesus. Last summer, my dad and I took a once-in-a-lifetime trip up and down the East Coast, and one day we went by to look at Fort McHenry. Fort McHenry is the site of the Battle of Baltimore, where as a prisoner on a boat, Francis Scott Key penned the poem that has become our national anthem. All night long, after feeling no hope for an American victory, the dawn's light broke only for him to see the star-spangled banner. The banner was his sign of hope. The banner told him that although those bombs had been going off all night long, his army had held the fort. Well, before, during, and after every battle, God's banner, Jesus Christ, is flying. He is the one that we look to for hope. He is the one that we turn to in repentance. So through these first four verses, what is David trying to teach us? Well, I think it's two simple things. He's trying to teach us to lament and repent. To lament and repent. We need to lament the loss that our sin brings. Um, I believe that it's time that we start admitting our part in the current situation. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but the church in America is like a war-torn place. And I think that we need to take ownership of the fact 
that some time ago we stopped taking Jesus seriously. We pushed him out to the margins of our lives. We treat him like an optional add-on. We treat his great commission like an inconvenient suggestion. We formed an appetite to be entertained rather than an appetite for the holiness of God. We multiplied and exported the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. We contradicted the very gospel that we professed while while trying to proclaim reconciliation, but seeking segregation. We stopped discipling and disciplining our own children and handed that responsibility over to other people. We have traded genuine Christianity, which proclaims a crucified and risen Savior, for smoke machines, video screens, and an emotional, sappy, Jesus is my homeboy garbage. We need to join David and lament. We are torn to pieces. We are staggering. But just like David, even as we lament, we have hope. See, God is so gracious that sometimes he sends snakes to bite us so that we will finally turn and look to his banner. God is so gracious that he rips apart our land so that we will finally flee to his kingdom. God is so gracious that he makes us see hard things so that we will finally turn and look to the most beautiful thing, his son, Jesus Christ. We should praise God that in his grace, rather than just letting his people float off into sin with no warning, he comes down and shakes us up because he is jealous for his church and he wants us to turn to him with reckless abandon. Repentance is our turning point in spiritual war because we cannot push back the darkness around us until we start getting serious about attacking the darkness in us. Second, David teaches us that remembrance is our fuel in spiritual war. Remembrance is our fuel in spiritual war. Maybe up to this point, we might be thinking, when God treats us in this way, does it mean that he doesn't love us? In fact, it is just the opposite. In verse five, David prays, that your beloved ones may be delivered. Give salvation by your right hand and answer us. David is teaching us something very important. One thing we must remember to fuel our spiritual war is our identity. Even in the midst of God's discipline, David calls Israel God's beloved ones. God might be angry with them, but his anger is fueled by his love for them. When God disciplines us, it actually proves that he loves us. Identity is who you believe that you are. Identity is tough enough for most of us, and it is even harder growing up in a culture that tells you that it is your responsibility to create your own identity. I want you to take just a second and write down one or two words that you feel like describe you. Don't think too hard about it. Just write down right off the top of your head, who do you think you are? Well, I wonder if God would agree with who you think you are. I know that many times in my life, I am tempted to listen to my own voice instead of God's. See, we were made by God. So truly, we are whoever he says that we are. So much of the spiritual war happens at the level of identity. When that first skirmish happened between the devil and Adam and Eve, it was a battle that was fought on the level of identity. And Genesis 3, 4, it says, but the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, right there on the spot, Eve could have said, hush, serpent, I already am like God. Or even better, uh, Eve's husband, 
Adam could have said, hush, serpent, she already is like God. They lost the battle at the level of identity. And when Jesus came to live as a man, he was also tempted on the level of identity. Matthew 4 says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Notice how this same serpent said, if you are the son of God, he was attacking Jesus at the level of his identity. Remembering who we are, remembering who God declares us to be is our fuel in spiritual war. Maybe you're thinking though, you know what? What difference does it really make? Does it really matter if I believe that God loves me or if I don't? Well, here's a few things to consider. If you believe that God loves you, then you won't be a slave to the opinions of all the people in your life. If you believe that God loves you, then you won't be constantly comparing your life to other people's. If you believe that God loves you, then you won't have to be frantically searching in life to try to create meaning for yourself. If you believe that God loves you, then you won't feel rejected and condemned every time something in life doesn't go your way. Most of the insecurities, the fears, the enslavements, and even the harsh ways that we treat other people come from the fact that we haven't actually settled deep in our hearts that God really loves us. But that's not the only remembrance that fuels us in spiritual war. In verse six, David tells us what God has to say. God has spoken in his holiness. With exultation, I will divide up Shechem and portion out the veil of Succoth. Gilead is mine, Manasseh is mine, Ephraim is my helmet, Judah is my scepter, Moab is my washbasin. Upon Edom, I cast my shoe. Over Philistia, I shout in triumph. Now, to us, this might sound like gibberish. But to David and the Israelites, this was the ultimate promise from God to his people. This was God's promise to have his people in his place with his presence enjoying his peace. This is the ultimate image of what all of our hearts were actually made for. Verses six and seven speak of God graciously and joyfully giving his uh, people their portion in the promised land. It is like a father who's come to the end of his life and he's overjoyed to pass on all that he has to his sons. They are his sons, he takes great joy in them and he is so happy to give them all that he has. And verse eight deals with their enemies. No matter how it might seem at the moment, this is the true vision of reality. Moab is my wash basin. Upon Edom, I cast my shoe. Over Philistia, I shout in triumph. Now look, I don't wanna be irreverent, but I think there's something here that we just can't miss. God, the holy, righteous God, is out here talking trash. He is totally disrespecting all of Israel's enemies. Uh, One time, Joe Namath predicted, we're going to win Sunday, I guarantee it, before leading the Jets to upset the Colts in the Super Bowl. Before Muhammad Ali defeated Sonny the Big Bear Liston, he said, after the fight, I'm gonna build myself a pretty home and use him as a bearskin rug. Liston even smells like a bear. He goes on to say, I'm going to give him to the local zoo after I whoop him. And one of my favorite instances of trash talking came from Bo Jackson, the famous double athlete all-star who once said, if my mother put on a helmet and shoulder pads and a uniform that wasn't the same as the one I'm wearing, I'd run her over if she was in my way. And I love my mother. Trash talking is like making a promise of victory that is meant to intimidate the opponent and galvanize supporters. And the number one rule of trash talking is that you have to be able to back it up. 
God is reminding his people that even the most towering enemies, the most intimidating powers, the greatest threats are no match for him. He is promising to crush their enemies and to lead them to victory. So if the first thing we have to remember as the fuel through spiritual war is our identity, then the second thing we have to remember are the promises of God. We are living in an age of promise. And in a way, the promise for us is no different than it was for Israel. God has promised to have his people in his place with his presence enjoying his peace. That is what we long for and that is what we look to. And we have this guarantee that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. The resurrected Jesus is the first artifact of the new creation. He comes from the future, the final place where God's people will dwell with him in his presence, enjoying his peace. Jesus went down into the grave as a man of the earth, and he came up out of the grave as a man of the new earth. In view of Christ's resurrection, we can know that we are bound for that eternal promised land. People who are bound for the promised land are fueled to fight their sin. People who are bound for the promised land act like they are just passing through this foreign place. People bound for the promised land aren't tempted by the praise of men or the deceitfulness of riches or the immaturity of instant gratification. People bound for the promised land have a vision of the future that explodes the disappointments of the present. People bound for the promised land aren't slaves to worldly success. They live their lives to store up treasures for that place where they know they are headed. There is hope in this world at war. It is the hope of the resurrection. God has already begun to divide up the inheritance and drive out the enemies from the land through the resurrection of Jesus. In the resurrection, Jesus stood over top of all of our greatest enemies and said, Satan is my wash basin. Upon death, I cast my shoe. Over sin, I shout in triumph. We are bound for the promised land and this guaranteed reality of our future fuels us through the spiritual war. I hope you can see now why spiritual war is not for the super saint. This is ordinary Christianity that is grounded in the gospel, the very power of God. So David has one last lesson for us in verses nine through 12. This one last thing about spiritual war that he wants us to know is that reliance is our triumph in spiritual war. Reliance is our triumph in spiritual war. David begins by asking some important questions. Who will bring me to the fortified city? Who will lead me to Edom? Have you not rejected us, O God? You do not go forth, O God, with our armies. See, David knows that while God is faithful to fulfill his promises, that David could only move forward towards God's promises if God takes him there. In other words, we can't force God's promises to come about even if we are sure that they will happen. We still have to wait and we still have to fight, even if we know that we are more than conquerors. In the little book of Obadiah, we learn that the nation of Edom was situated in a cleft in the rock. Their fortress seemed impenetrable. It seemed like there was no way that anyone could get in and take them out. By all human definitions, it was going to be impossible for Israel's enemies to be driven out of the land. They had hit a brick wall. Some of you may have heard this story, but a man named Theodore Seuss Geisel, uh, who would later uh, come to be known as Dr. Seuss, was rejected 27 times by publishers before having his first book published. When he died in 1991, he had sold over 600 million copies of his books. 
Uh, after the 27th rejection, he was ready to give up. He was actually on his way home to burn his manuscripts when he just so happened to bump into a friend who had started a new job that very morning as an editor at a, at a publishing company. Dr. Seuss said later, if I had been going down the other side of Madison Avenue, I'd be in the dry cleaning business today. Now, my point in telling this story is not that you are necessarily going to sell 600 million copies of your books or uh, that all your wildest dreams are going to come true. My point is that God has promised us a future that is impossible for us to attain in our own strength. This psalm is about fighting the good fight of faith when we live between what we know God has promised and the current situation that we find ourselves in. We have all found ourselves feeling at the end of our rope. We have all felt like getting from where we are now to where God has promised seems impossible. The spiritual war we find ourselves in is fighting to trust God when we've been rejected for the 27th time, but we know that he's promised us 600 million copies sold. The only victory in spiritual war is casting ourselves completely upon the mercy and strength of Jesus. So when it seems that the promise of God is impossible, when it seems like the peace and rest that we desperately long for is escaping us, we have two options, which brings us to our last two verses. In verse 11 and 12, David prays, oh, grant us help against the foe, for vain is the salvation of man. With God, we shall do valiantly. It is he who will tread down our foes. When we are met with the impossible, we can either seek salvation in some man-made way or we can thrust ourselves completely upon God. We are really good at crafting our own saviors. We can make a savior out of almost anything. A savior is something that we run to to lift us up, to give us success, and to deliver us. Sure, we can get some success by using the world's methods. We can achieve some sense of peace by slowing down and meditating. We can be lifted up out of the dumps by positive thinking. We can be delivered by a good friend or a bank loan. But in the end, when we're standing before the judgment seat of God, will those things have really saved us? No amount of earthly success, no amount of praise from men, No amount of worldly peace will still be meaningful 10,000 years from now when God has come to call us all to account. When we meet him face to face, all of those things will be vanity. This is Christianity, that God both defines our battles and he wins our battles. The salvation of man is vain because we create the wrong problems and then concoct a false savior to fix those problems. We are doubly damned. In other words, when we think our greatest enemy is poverty, then we become a slave to the savior of success. When we think our greatest enemy is shame, then we become a slave to the savior of popularity. When we think our greatest enemy is discomfort, then we become a slave to the savior of getting a buzz. Vain is the salvation of man because we create the wrong wrong problems and then concoct false saviors to try to solve those problems. The gospel is teaches us who our real enemies are and then offers us the only real savior. The gospel teaches us that our real foes are sin, death, and Satan. And in the wisdom of God, Jesus defeated death by dying. Jesus defeated sin by taking our sin upon himself. And Jesus took away all of Satan's power by becoming weak. If we rely upon ourselves in spiritual war, we will be doubly damned. But if we rely on Jesus, we will be doubly delivered. Jesus opens our eyes to see who our real enemies are, and it is he who will tread down our foes. Our calling in spiritual war is to attack all that is dark in us and around us with the light of Christ. We fight from his victory. 
We wage war knowing that he has already triumphed. We walk onto the battle, battlefield with full confidence that by faith in him, we are more than conquerors. So let me lead you, leave you with just a few concluding thoughts this morning. All of us are in a war, whether we want to admit it or not. Spiritual warfare is not for the super saint, and it is not about super spiritual paranormal activity. While our enemy is real and wants nothing more than to destroy us, our fight in the spiritual battle